All right, let's do it. All right, let's do it. Uh, I'm already rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep those doggies rolling. That's right. You're listening to session number 34 of the podcast engineering show. Barry, ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. We're back. <laughs> Actually, that's from a. Some Saturday Night Live sketch. They were doing like some radio sketch, and whenever they came back on the air, they'd be like, "And we're back!" That's awesome. Which was crazy. But anyway, I don't know why I just say that naturally. But welcome to the show, everyone. This is the podcast engineering show. My name's Chris Curran. I'm gonna do an abbreviated introduction this episode. I think I'm gonna see how quick I can do this. So I'm Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for Forbes and Dun and Bradstreet as well as select business authors and companies. Each week on this show, we talk shop all about the audio engineering side of podcast production. We don't get into all the other aspects of podcasting, which are very important. We stick to the audio engineering side. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business, and since I entered podcasting about four years ago, I've noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting, and that's where this show can help. And so many of the guests who've been on this show are people who've emailed me and said, man, I love your show. This is awesome. And uh, that's the case today. So, of course, Barry is here with me as I finish fading the music. Barry, you ready to go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. What else do you have to say, Barry? Uh, Barry, what do you... uh, (laughs) You know, it's hard when you look at sound clips and then you have to quickly think of a question for an answer that's already there. But Barry... What are we going to need this episode? I mean, let's let's really get into it. What are we going to need? I mean, I know you usually say horses and mules, right? You're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules. <laughs> and what else? Are we going to need to have a good show? Saws, hammers, <laughs> nails. Anything else? Monkeys, pumas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like your laugh, Barry. It never gets, I, I never get tired of hearing Barry, I have to be honest. And of course, the class. Barry, what'd you have for uh, breakfast? Beans, coffee, and biscuit, and a little piece of fat back. <laughs> I wish I had that breakfast this morning, believe me. <laughs> right? Hey, quick shout out to the podcasting course. That's right. This is going to be a two or three day event in Lexington, Kentucky in April of next year. It's it's a course designed for podcasters in medical education. So look, you might not be in medical education, but if you know anybody, definitely tell them. Send them to thepodcastingcourse.com. That's the website. I'm going to be speaking there. We're going to have a great time. And like I said last episode or a few episodes ago, I don't know if you need to be like, I don't know if you need to prove your credentials in medical education to attend. (laughs) So anyway, go check out the website and talk to Rob and some of the other guys that are, that are putting it on. It seems it's going to be a great event. And of course the podcast engineering school, the courses, uh, I'm working on the courses. I don't know if they're ready yet. By the time this comes out, I don't know if they'll be up yet, but check the website, podcastengineeringschool.com. I'm going to do one on EQ, and I'm going to do one on compression. Those are going to be my first two courses. But I want to make them really good, so it it's taking a little time. So today, you know who's here. You probably read it in the show title. It's Greg Heist. He's the producer and co-host of The Future Stir, thefuturestir.com. That's the website. And what's cool is when Greg sent me his website, I went, of course, I went to the website, and the the theme he's using, I think it's a WordPress theme, right, Greg? It is indeed, yeah. The theme you're using is just amazing. I've never seen a website like it. I mean, I don't consider myself like a connoisseur of websites, but man, it's such a cool theme. And I I replied to your email and I was like, dude, what is that theme? You also produce a company podcast for your company that you work for, uh, the Gongus Innovation Podcast, which is cool. Those are your two shows, right? Exactly. Those are my two shows. And I may be one of the newest podcasters you have had on this show. Really? We we launched the Future Stir July 8th of this year. And my Gongus Innovation internal podcast launched like at the end of April. Okay. So the end of April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Yeah, six months. Yeah. Wow. So what about before we... Well, first of all, welcome to the show, Greg. Really happy to have you you on here. It is so great to be here. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know. I'm honored it's... to be among the, pan- but you know, because uh, you know, you've had some pretty stellar guests, so I feel honored to be uh, just even uh, on the show. So right. Thank you. 
Yeah, so we um, it, and and it's funny because you know a lot of like we did, Greg. You and I emailed back and forth, but you know, seven minutes ago is when we first met each other, really. So it's it, it's not just like, hey, happy to have you on the show. I'm happy to meet you, really. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. So you're from Michigan, and um, again, the futurestir dot com is is the what is your show about, by the way, real quick. So it's the uh, we call it the sto- the the podcast that's about the future of everything, and specifically, stir refers to the future of society, technology, intelligence, and retail. So every week, we spend time uh, going in depth on a specific topic or interview someone who has a specific take on the future, and then my podcast partner Ben Smithy and I uh, also start each episode with a couple of quick hits of just things that we're coming across that. Uh, relate to the future that are sometimes zany, sometimes crazy, but always, uh, we hope, entertaining. Right? I, the, what, a, what a topic, the future. Hey, I have, I have something for you. The organization that my wife and I started three and a half years ago is called Pause Your Life, and we do mm-hmm. retreats and meetups. It's about hitting the pause button in your life. And one of the things we're pushing for in the future is that every person in the world, for at least one week out of the year, needs to go just on a retreat, be by yourself, just chill, just do nothing and, and reflect, reflect on your life because we don't do enough reflection on our lives. We're always on the hamster wheel running a thousand miles an hour. And you know, I love this quote, the pauses between the words are what give meaning to the sentence. Yeah. And also the pauses in music often make it come to life, you know? (laughs) So it's, that's the spaces. You're right. Spaces are important. I love that. That's we right. Have to, we may have to uh, talk more about this. Mm, to yes. Come on the future stir. <laughs> I All love it. <laughs> All right. So, Greg, let's go through the speed round. Take us through. Oh, by the way, the two shows that you're producing, the Future Stir and the Gongus Innovation Podcast, do you produce them both both the same way? Basically, basically, basically a similar workflow. Um, the only difference is is that my internal Gongus Innovation podcast is much more likely to involve at least three people being interviewed, and I have a remote co-host. And I have a remote co-host for both of these, but for the Gongus Innovation one, it's often uh, between three and six people that we're interviewing at one time. So it, it does get a little bit more ungainly in terms of managing all that. So I do have a slightly different way of approach some of those things. Okay. So let's um let's talk about the future stir then. And because if you know if your basic method of recording and stuff is pretty much the same, then we'll just we'll just talk about that show. That'll probably make it easier. Perfect. So so take us through this is the speed round. So take us through very quickly through you're about to start an episode you're sitting down to record take us through your you know from your microphone through your equipment to your software take us through the whole process sounds good so uh i'm recording through a sure sm7b with a cloud lifter cl1 those are the the mic and pre that i use nice. um i purchased thankfully a heil pl2t overhead broadcast boom i had a really cheapy one um before and it lasted about two weeks before it broke oh. so um i i i upped for the uh, more expensive one and have been super happy with that which one broke by the way uh, it was like a pile it was pile. like a ro- okay. appropriately named pile okay. um and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well wait, you wait. know when i was like torquing it um actually my my first mic was a uh was a, a blue yeti pro with their you know their radius uh suspension system their the oh. um what do they call that? That's oh, the, the shock uh, mount. The shock mount, yeah. And that thing is so darn heavy. That, <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. So I, I was like using the wing nut to tighten it up, and it literally snapped off in my hand. So. Oh, man. So, by the way, uh, Barry was actually present. When, when, you, after, when you called Pile after your, after your boom arm broke, Barry was actually on that phone call. Barry, what did you hear on that phone call? And they were cussing up a storm. <laughs> Profanities left. Profanities right. Really? What was Greg saying? Every second word was a hip word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know what? There probably might have been a few of those <laughs> mixed in. There's All right. No so now you got your high PL2T arm, which is much better. Highly recommended. Um, and then recently I purchased a second generation Focusrite Scarlet 18i20. And I run that into a MacBook Pro, like mid-2015. Uh, and then I also use 
of course, the Focusrite control software for custom mix minus stuff, which is actually important when you have more than one person remote. And then also I back up into a Zoom H5 with the, what they call the uh, dual XLR TRS capsule on top. So I can actually run up to four, 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 four lines simultaneously or four tracks simultaneously. Oh, wow. Oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to step through this. Yeah. And then finally, um, I monitor on a pair of Bowers & Wilkins P6 headphones, um, which I love. Really? How much do they cost? They're about $400, um, but they are fantastic. And my wife actually has a pair, which I also use occasionally, a pair of Bang & Olufsen Bioplay H6 headphones. Mm. And those are also really neutral and really, really solid. And they're about the same, about 400 bucks. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, monitoring is not something podcasters usually even think about, but it's it's like so important. It's nutty. Yeah, I mean, both from the monitoring as well as from the editing. I mean, I, I have small children, so I don't have studio monitors at this point yet. Mm. And so a lot of my editing is done using these headphones. So I wanted to have my well, love. I'm an audiophile just by nature. Mm. So just being able to have that and feel like I have a really good handle on what's really happening with the sound is is really important. Nice. So you, what software do you record into? Keep, keep going. I record into uh, Adobe Audition, uh, which is, I know is very popular on this show among guests. <laughs> I, I, I raise my hand and join the ranks of Adobe Audition right. fans. Uh, I record that uh, usually at 48 kilohertz, 32-bit floating point. And um, the other thing which I've also added is a Furman power strip because I was getting uh, electrical noise and that has done a wonderful job of eliminating any ground noise that's just coming from having dirty power. Cool. Got rid of the the hum. Right. Exactly. And then um, for my interviews, so uh, if I'm interviewing people, I have... A set of the three pack for forty dollar Behringer Ultra Voice eighteen uh, hundreds, and then I also recently purchased a blue a pair of Blue Encore one hundreds, which are really really nice mics as well. Blue Encore one hundreds. Mm-hmm. It's their handheld dynamic mic, and they have I think three or four models of it, and really really nice sound. Um, did a lot of research, and they. Uh, are rated very favorably to the Shure SM57. Interesting, and it's this, in the shape of a normal handheld mic. Yeah, it's a, and it's actually a, it's it's really like a lot of blue mics. It's actually really well designed as well. Very sturdy. Very uh, it can handle a lot of abuse. And so that's actually also going to be my mobile kit um, when I go and interview people uh, in person. I'll just use that. And I also recently purchased for home a Focusrite Scarlett 6i6, just so I don't have to lug that 18i20 back and forth between my office and home. So, All right. Nice. So then your co-hosts are remote. How do you connect them? Yeah, so we usually connect over Skype, and uh, my podcast partner, Ben, uses, wait for it, the Blue Yeti. (laughs) Um, which actually does then come into the whole editing and uh, processing end, which we will talk about later. <laughs> right. um, and then my uh, internal, uh, for my other podcast, I actually sent him, um, he lives in, in the Cincinnati area, I sent him a Samson Q2U dynamic USB mic after I learned the debacle of the using the Yeti in anything mm. but a studio environment. And that actually works really, really well. Okay. And they connect through your computer? Well, so, so they, I've actually got them now recording locally. So he's rec- my uh, Ben is recording via GarageBand. And then Jimmy, who I do the other podcast with, records um, through Audacity. Right. So you just connect via Skype just to monitor right, each just other. Right. Just to monitor. And I usually what, usually what I wind up doing is I make a recording of everything as well as a backup. And then they're doing their double unders. So I'm hoping that we've got it covered. Right. So you're what their Skype signal, you're recording that on your side at, just in case and then they're sending you their recording which is the real one. Right on. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. So then you have audition uh any crazy stuff you do in post? No, not anything crazy, but I I um I learned a lot. Like I I started out using Audacity and within about again I, like I switched my gear within four episodes, I changed the DAW within four episodes too because it just was getting just, I knew it wasn't going to be able to do what I wanted it to do. And so 
you know, within Audition, I use um, I use a few plugins, which I think we can talk about later. The Focusrite Red Two EQ and the Focusrite Red Three compressor. Nice. And then also this other one, which is it's called the SoftTube Drummer Seventy Three, which is what they call an intelligent master processor, and it does a really neat. It's it's kind of like a really dumbed down version of a multi band compressor, and you literally have different settings that you can choose as well as an an air switch, which I think really does a really nice job with just giving it just a little bit of a different sort of sheen to it, which I really like. That's so funny. I actually got that plug in like six or nine months ago myself, and I really liked it. It's the S73? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's It, it works really well. And it's <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, it's literally just like push a button and it does its thing, which is kind of cool, actually. I like that. Yeah. It's like you you choose... There, there's a bunch of, bunch of different like mastering settings, and then basically then you just have to figure out your input drive like how much do you want to feed into it so how much it compresses it and then the air switch is awesome funny story about that plugin is i used it on this project where the woman's voice needed more air like it was a little dull so i used it and then later on i realized that she had all these different mouth noises going on and like i didn't realize it until later cuz it it kept going through the whole project it was like you know, 10 hours of audio or something or whatever, eight hours. And, and then I realized, oh my God, I have to go through and remove these mouth noises because, you know, it was like this meditative project where you're supposed to be wearing headphones and you're supposed to be meditating. And all I could hear was the woman's mouth noises. And I'm like, that's not good. So yeah, actually that's so, that's so not Zen, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the air setting that I used on the drummer S73 actually exacerbated all the mouth noises. And then I had to go through and remove them all, which took forever. Oh, I bet. But it sounded better. In the end, it sounded great. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I really like that plugin a lot. It seems like it's uh, it's got some good stuff to it. Right. And then you bounce it down to MP3. Yeah, well, actually, what I do, so what I do is, um, you know, so I apply the the EQ and the compression on a per track basis, and then I run the drummer on the master track. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm generally using similar, very similar settings on compression. EQ, I'm, uh, you know, addressing each track individually, but then using the drummer on the, on the master track. And then what I do is I bounce that out as a wave file and then run it through a phonic leveler generally mm. and then have that generate the mp3 that i use now the only difference is when i've done some of these you know more than three people interviews then i've used the Auphonic multi-track just as a way of just exporting all the stems that i recorded in audition run those through you know, a phonic multi-track and then import those back in and then edit with that much cl more cleaned up set of uh, tracks that's so cool that you do that um i no one on this show has actually said they've done that they you know process down all the different tracks into stems and which is basically just keeping it all separate tracks and then feeding all the stems into uh all phonic multi-track yeah and i think is, actually when i when i did it when i did it the first time what I did is I actually went through and I did the edits to all of the tracks and then exported the edited versions. And what I found was maybe there's just like a couple of places where the phasing got just a little bit off and it what the sound wasn't exactly the, the way I would want it. Like there was a little bit of a ring where I think it was just not leveling, like not clearing out the, the crosstalk perfectly. Mm. So I think what I will do going forward is just export the raw recording have it cleaned up with an Auphonic multi-track and then import it back in and then edit those versions. Right. Yeah, and I would... Well, and then you you would compress and EQ each track separately first before you make the stem? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, if you weren't doing that, I was definitely going to suggest that because Auphonic does this thing where it'll level it to a certain loudness level, but depending on the EQ of the voice, like if, a, if, if there's a track that's very mid-rangey, it'll bring that up to, let's say, minus 18 or minus 16 luffs. But then if you have a track that's very bassy, it'll bring that one to the same level, but perceptually, there'll be a big difference. The, the one that's more mid-rangey will sound a lot louder. 
Yeah, and you know the thing. I, the other thing that I've noticed is that, um, and I think you mentioned this on the show, is that it feels like coming out of uh, Afonic that there's a little bit more sibilance to the the output. Even though Afonic will swear up and down that they're not doing anything to EQ, I'm not sure if it's just perceptually how you hear it because of the loudness change. But I definitely am starting to look at more like how can I account for that when I am in the process of EQing. Yeah, I I often use a compressor when, for some of my clients who actually aren't my clients anymore, uh, the shows are finished. But um, yeah, I would use Alphonic because of the uh, the Blue Yeti. Oh yes, yes. And uh, th- so anyway, I'd use Alphonic, but then it would be a little sibilant, so I would use a deesser. That may be because of the attack of whatever compressor or limiter they're using. Um, that's one thing. I've noticed, and I've known this for a while, but um, if you change the attack of your compressor or limiter, it can affect sibilance a lot because if you make your attack really short, it'll catch the beginning of those S's and, and squash them down. But if you make your attack like, you know, well, f- even 40 or 50 milliseconds, which is kind of a lot, it'll let a lot of the S through. So it'll be louder. It'll seem louder. Um, so it's almost like you can... You can actually try it, containing the sibilance with the attack of the compressor. Now, the attack affects the sound in other ways as well, which you have to be aware of, but uh, it does affect the sibilance as well. Yeah, and I think when I have been using the RED3 compressor, I've kind of been keeping it maybe a little bit more towards the fast side, and I think that's actually a really good idea just to experiment with moving that much faster and see what that does. Yeah, in my experience, right around 30 to 34 milliseconds is like the attack that I normally use because that's kind of right in the middle. It's not too much. It's not too quick or it's not too long. It's kind of like right in the middle. Um, it, I mean, look, that's just for me, for my taste. That's kind of where I keep you know, my presets at, right? Right. Uh, I, I can always adjust it, but that's where the, the preset is. Now, on the Focusrite red to plug in the EQ plugin, of course, the attack is just a knob. There's no numbers, <laughs> right? <laughs> on the, so you're kind of, I'm kind of guessing. I'm winging it on that. Yeah, one. yeah. So normally I keep it at about. I'm trying to think. Ten o'clock or ten thirty. If if you're looking at the knob as a clock, yeah. The attack I keep around ten or ten thirty. If if I want to cut off sibilance or cut down on the attack, I'll go down to like nine or even eight o'clock. Anyway, that's kind of the range that I... Yeah, and I think, you know, and actually, that's actually a really good point, because, you know, uh, sometimes, obviously, when we have guests that we're recording, and we are recording them via, you know, via Skype, and so that signal is much more compressed, so I'm wondering whether that might be also something to factor into how you compress a compressed signal. Yeah, yeah, you got to be careful, because you can end up over-compressing. Right, right, it's a very fine line. And making it... Yeah, it... It's weird combining, compressing something that's already been compressed because of the attack and release times. It can make this weird pumping and breathing thing, which it can be very <laughs> difficult to figure out. I've done that before. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then you have the MP3 and then you just, you, you know, tag it as normal and upload it somewhere, right? Correct. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's step through this. You, ha- you use an SM7B. Yes. Through a cloud lifter. CL1, and then the cloud lifter, you come out of that and go into your 18i20. Yep, exactly. And that has made a huge difference. I I shudder to think what it would be like to record without it, quite honestly. Yeah, so the SM7B, yeah, does require quite a bit of gain. But the Focusrite mic pre's are, are, you know, definitely better than average. Yeah, and definitely better than the pre's that I had. I had an Allen and Heath Z14 mixer before I before I bought the Scarlet. Uh, and even though those are thought to be very good preamps, like the focus rights are just way better, much quieter in my opinion. Yeah, and even in terms of like mixers, like Mackie is I I use Mackie and the mic pre's are pretty clean. I think another, like a step down from Mackie are the Behringer mixers and probably the Allen and Heath mixers as well. So, yeah, the mic pre makes a big difference, you know? <laughs> I know. All right. It, so it makes, me, it makes me want to experiment more with that in the future, but, you know, the budget is the budget. So, <laughs> well, look, 
the cloud lifter probably makes a really big difference right there. So you're right now you're probably really good. I mean, if if you want to go nutty like me and you know have one piece of gear that's like thirty five hundred bucks and has a has a mic pre and compressor and EQ and all that, it's it's a channel strip. You know, because I'm a nut job like that, <laughs> and I you know. At some point, I may record music again, and at some point, I may need to actually plug a real vocal mic into a real mic pre and EQ and compressor. So that's why I have it. Um, plus, you know, we like our toys, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's called it's called gas, right? Gear acquisition syndrome. I, I have a I have a case of that. Quite honestly, Chris. There you go. All right, so you go into your MacBook Pro, and okay, so mix control. So the Scarlett Two I Two, which is the a very popular Scarlett audio interface. That does not come with Mix Control. Mix Control is like this, it's like a software window that opens on your computer, which has all different faders, and you can manage your inputs and outputs and create mix minuses, and you can do a lot, actually. Um, but when you step up to certainly the 18i20, did the 6i6 come with Mix Control? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, this, and I think what they had is they had Mix Control, and then I think they've um, recently changed it to be called, now they call it Focusrite Control. And it is really cool because you do have the ability to do, I'm not exactly sure, three or four custom mixes for all of your outputs, mm -hmm. which then allows me to then send a different mix minus to someone who's remote via Skype versus the co-host. And then have, when I'm interviewing people in the same room, then I have a mix for them and then run that out of a, I have a Behringer headphone amp and then a set of speakers or a set of headphones for all of them to be able to listen in while we're, while we're doing the interview. Right, right. And I will, I recently came across someone who's basically doing everything in the box. So taking Skype calls and routing things all with all in just within one computer. And so I, I do want to point out that the mix control is basically a hardware interface mixer. So if you had Skype open on the same computer, like Skype doesn't show up in the mix control, like as a fader or anything like that. Right. Yeah, I think you have to use other, there's other programs. And I know for Mac, it's better. Mac has certain programs that can do all that routing within a Mac. Um, and I know PCs have the same thing, but it's a, probably not as reliable <laughs> or and more annoying. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, I actually, uh, when I record via Skype, I usually run the, the Skype call through, I have a Dell laptop. So I usually use that device just to handle the Skype so I don't have to deal with any um, issues of processing and recording on the, the, you know, on the Mac. So it remains dedicated. Yeah. See, that's, look, if you can have it that way, that's the way to go because then, you know, coming out of your Dell goes into the Focusrite 18i20 and then coming one of the outputs from the 18i20 goes back to the Dell. And then that way, with the mix control, you can actually control what is being received and sent to the Dell, which is awesome. Yeah, and that's exactly the way I, I worked to, I've worked to do it, and it works really well. I actually tried to do the record the Skype and run Skype through the Mac once, and um, it was so clicky and messed up that I actually had to redub my half of the interview oh. or the whole podcast because it was just not usable. Oh, so you had to overdub all your questions? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was fun because I had my 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 uh, other podcast partner, you know, I was listening to his comments back and forth and I had to like recreate what I was saying <laughs> with the right tone, which was, um, it, was an, it was a fun challenge. Totally. That's the trick. You have to emote genuinely. It's like, that's right. How about laughing? Ha ha ha! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's to right. laugh in the right tone. Yeah, I'm not a voiceover <laughs> actor, so that that becomes especially difficult, you know. Totally. Oh my goodness! All right, so you use a Zoom H5. That's your backup. That's my backup. And and you said you have the the little thing on the front of it, which can so it can accept four inputs. Are you actually feeding four inputs into it? I run. I've run up to three simultaneously in it. I haven't tried it with four. But I absolutely could if I needed to or if I wanted to. So then, you know, then what winds up happening then is, and that's the great thing about the 18 i 20 right, is you can then say, all right, here's these other outputs, and I want to define this input to be that output so I can run a separate set of outputs from the 18 i 20 into the Zoom. Got it. And then that gives me, you know, both an analog recording as well as the digital recording via Audition. Right. So like your mic going into the I-20, you can tell the 18 I-20, send output number seven 
to and and have that go into the Zoom H5. And you can do the same thing with another mic and another mic. That that's pretty cool. I haven't actually heard anyone do that. I mean, even my little dig, little handheld digital recorder backup thing is um it's only stereo. So it's the stereo mix coming off my mixer, which contains all the audio, but it it's bounced down to stereo. Um, and again, that's just for safety, right? That's just like, just I ne- I never use it either. I never <laughs> I never use it. I just fill up the card with once the me- the card's full of memory, I just delete it and start again. And I never download anything off of it because it's just for like that nightmare situation if if the computer gets fried or or something happens, then at least I have it. But but you being able to do that with multi tracks with up to four different tracks, that's pretty cool. It is, and I think you know. Again, I'm I'm in the same boat. I it's not my main recording, but I like the scent, the thought that if something were to ever happen, I would still be able to process and you know do all the post production of the show in the same way using those those backup multi track files. Now, did you level the H five? So I know for me, like I run a one K tone through my board, and I can actually level every output, every direct out. And the input of my Focusrite 18 i 20 interface. So I use a tone because that's what we did in the music studios. You can use a 1K tone to actually level everything to make sure that like 0 dB on the mixer is exactly 0 dB on the Scarlet. Or actually, I set mine, I set zero, 0 coming out of the board, I put at minus 3 on the Scarlet because the Scarlet. It starts from zero and goes down, right? There's no plus, right, so it's. Right. I set it at minus three. So then, so when I what I see on my board, I know what's going to the scarlet. Even beyond that, I take that one K tone and I zero it on the board, and then the the stereo output that goes to my little handheld digital recorder, the backup one, right? Hmm. I put that at minus three as well. So. Like basically, I'm just making sure that all my levels are set, so I basically have to look in one place, and then I know it's good everywhere. Did you do anything like that, or was it more just kind of trial and error? It, yeah, actually, that's this is the uh, this is the bonus of being on this show. You learn something new, and so <laughs> I just learned something new. I hadn't thought of that, and that's actually a really good idea. No, I actually, I've I've actually mostly just eyeballed it, and have, with the exception of one time, been pretty safe on that. Although one time I did early in the uh, recording process, just completely blow out <laughs> <I'm> recording. <laughs> so that so that was you know like you were talking about the mouth noise thing. I yeah. had to like figure out how to make uh, clipped audio sound acceptable. Oh, it was not fun. Yeah, you can't do you can't really you can't do that in, in audacity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So was, <laughs> Should have made was a many video hours. Of that. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was many hours with uh, very mediocre results. So yeah, that's t- look. If you record something way too hot digitally and it gets crunchy, that you can't remove the crunch. I mean, that's there's no way. Even it reminds me of uh, I don't know if you like the band Soundgarden. Love Soundgarden. Yeah, the album Super Unknown. Right. To me, I'm gonna geek out for a second. To me, that album, as far as songwriting goes, is just one of the greatest albums ever. Oh, agreed. But the the quality of the recording and the production is, I, I don't really like it. I mean, look, Brendan O'Brien mixed it, but he tried to save it because I know the guy who recorded it and he was like coked out of his head, I think. Um, I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> just a moment. It's just, you, just between you and I, Chris. It's okay. <laughs> oh, you know, well... You know what? <laughs> I'm he really wasn't thinking. having his best day. Let's put it that way. He wasn't having his best days when he was recording. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. In fact, I'm not even sure who did it now that I think about it. I'm trying to save myself, Greg. <laughs> um, well done. Anyway, there's one of the songs on there, Fell on Black Days. It's one of their hit songs. Right. And near the very end, when it's basically him, this music stops and it's him solo singing he blows out the mic and it's all crunchy. I mean, you can hear it. It's like, I mean, it's not even, it, it, it's so obvious. <laughs> and look, look, so it even happens in the real studio when probably back then they were probably recording to tape. But still, you blow out a mic pre and it gets crunchy. So so anyway, I don't know why I said that whole story because it was funny, I guess. But um, and, and don't do that. <laughs> don't be that guy. And that, hey, it happens. I know there's a lot of, many Zeppelin songs that have that too. In fact, there's one Zeppelin song 
is it going to California when he's singing? He's singing nice. And then right before the one section, he goes, watch out now. He literally said that and they kept it in the record. He was saying that to the probably saying that to the recording engineer because right then he starts belting like mad. And it's the level change would have been very significant. So he's telling the the engineer, hey, watch out now. <laughs> Ride that fader, please. <laughs> yeah, here it comes. Um, oh, that's crazy. So you record an audition at 48 kilohertz, 32 bit. And, and here's why. Hold on Only- a second. Barry, what do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude. Uh, and the only reason is is that 48K is kind of the video standard, right? Right. I think like that's generally... And, and so I've done some video stuff. So since I'm now the guy with the gear at work, when there's voiceover work that needs to be done, they come into my office <laughs> and we do the voiceovers. So I just kind of keep it at 48K just because uh, just out of habit, I think. Yeah. That's good. 48 is awesome. I mean, look, because when you make it the standard MP3, it'll it dithers it down to 44.1, no problem. And it's better to start higher and dither it down later, de- you know, degrade it later, which is awesome. But 32 bit, that's awesome. And and look, I know in Audacity that like I've never used Audacity, really. I mean, I think I opened it once just to, because I had a client who was using it and I had to know, tell her where to, what menu to go to to click something. But I literally never recorded into it. But apparently, it automatically records at 32-bit, but then you have to export it? Is that the way it works? I don't know. I mean, out of Audacity? Yeah. I think it does. I think it does. I know that um, when I pull up the default within Audition, it is... 32-bit floating point is the default oh. on my software. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 32-bit is, I mean, awesome for the depth. We, I talked about that on one of the other episodes. I went all into bit depth and <laughs> word length and... <laughs> all that good all, stuff. <laughs> all that cool stuff. So, yeah, but that's awesome. See, I, I do 48K but 24-bit, and even that's big for me, but I'm actually producing many, many shows. And, I mean, man, this the space on the hard drive just gets filled up so fast when you're recording like that. So for you, you're doing two shows and you know, you might do a couple more. I'm assuming as you go, you'll start doing a couple more shows, but so even if you have three, four shows, you can still record at that really high level. And it, that's the way to go. If you can do it, do it. Right. Yeah. And actually my wife actually said the words, I'm thinking maybe of doing a podcast. Dude. And I said, I think I might be able to help you with that. Oh, man. So, yeah, she's very passionate about nutrition and school lunches, and she wants to start this podcast about educating parents about what good lunches are all about and you know, helping um, encourage school districts to adopt higher standards for nutrition for purchased lunches as well. So that may be happening. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Oh, that's awesome. There you go. So now what mic is she going to use? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> is she gonna get her own mic does she, she probably the, will the pr40 will sound good <laughs> that's right she may have to you know it's just because it's it's it would be an excuse right there you go well you never know <laughs> hey but if you're the producer you could say listen honey this is the best mic for you <laughs> that's right you will love it you'll love it it sounds love it. beautiful oh, be... all right so the firm and power strip i guess you had a little bit of a ground hum um now, let me, because I, I kind of realized this when I was telling you about using the 1K tone to zero out the levels, is that you're not actually using a mixing board. Correct. Yeah. I'm not so, using a mixing board at all. The only, the only controls that I'm using, I mean, the Focusrite control software has essentially virtual, um, you know, uh, faders. So I can adjust right. in that software as well as within, you know, Audition as well. But... Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure within Audition, I can generate a 1K tone as well and yes. probably do a similar sort of thing with the Focusrite control between that and then the um, Audition software. Right. into the And then into the Zoom H5. Right. You'll be able to use the 1K tone in the software and then level it everywhere else. Yep. So That'll I'm going to try that. I'm going to definitely try that and see what that does. That's a really good idea. Yeah. It's... And... and yeah. I mean... Look, for pot, like most of these tricks are 
a little bit overkill for podcasting. And I realize that. I totally realize that. I'm not here thinking that every podcaster is going to start, <laughs> you know, using a 1K tone to zero out all their gear. I don't expect that, but it's it's a way where you can really know what the level is everywhere. So you're not guessing anymore. And once you take that doubt out of your mind, then you're free to think about other things, right? It's more about the mental noise in your own head and being sure about what you're doing, right? And making sure the level's good and not crunchy. Totally true. And, you know, it's actually interesting as, as I've gotten into this, I've actually got it, gotten interested in the idea of doing home studio recording as well because I love music and my kids are in School of Rock. And so I'm actually going to start experimenting with that. So these kind of tips are actually helpful because... I started listening to those types of podcasts as well. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, the other, I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah, the other benefit is when you have your level zeroed out, like, like for instance, me, I'm using my mic pre and compressor and EQ. My, I'm using my channel strip before it even goes to the mixer, which before it even goes to the 18i20 and gets recorded. I have my settings there set. I have everything on the board set. Everything is set. So, like, when I... If I ever had to overdub a word or a section, or if I had to go back and replace something, or even just my level from week to week, it's always exactly the same. <laughs> like, there's no question about that. Which so is awesome. That it's helpful in the long, in the long run. It's helpful when you start producing more stuff. All right. So the firm and power strip. What are you plugging into this power strip? So I'm basically running the Mac as well as the Focusrite into it. Okay. So and both of those devices are going into it. And before you had the power strip, you had them plugged into just a regular power strip or the wall? Just the wall. The wall. Yeah. And yeah. then you were and getting the little hum. Yep. And it was annoying because then I said, oh, now I have to do some sort of noise reduction to get rid of that. I'm like, well, why don't I just fix that, you know, spend 50 or 60 bucks and get the right thing. And then that's one thing I don't have to do because I hate having to do noise reduction if I don't have to. And so to me, that was just one less thing to have to worry about. Yeah, I mean, the hums are, you know, the ground hums are some of the most frustrating things that can happen in studios. <laughs> People pull their hair out, they go nuts. Um, right. One one other thing, one other solution is to get a little ground lift, which is uh, this little, it's like a little attachment that the the prongs from your computer and the focus right are probably like the three prong, right? It has the two prongs and then it has the circular ground prong, right? So what happens is sometimes if you're plugging them into the wall, there ends up being this weird grounding thing happening, and that's what the hum is. But if you get a ground lifter, you can you plug the three prongs into that, and then that only has two prongs that goes into the wall. So you're basically severing the ground connection, and a lot of times that will remove the ground hum as well. Um, now, some people have said, oh, isn't that dangerous? The piece of equipment's not grounded. Well, look, I mean, if you're recording in a lightning storm or I don't know what, maybe it has any, something to do with it. But I've been doing, I've been using ground lifts forever in the studios. You know, guys like uh, Puffy or Biggie would come into the studio and they'd set up their MPC-60 or or their SP-12 drum machine. And then we'd put, it, we'd put up the faders on the board and it's like, Meh. like you hear the hum and it's like, you know, either you're going to piss somebody off or you better get rid of that hum. So you just use a ground lift and then they do a session for 10 hours and it's fine. Then they unplug it and go home. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with ground lifts and that's kind of an easy way, especially in the moment, if you just need to get rid of something. For instance, my main recording computer without a ground lift, the output, there's a hum and it's very annoying. So I actually just use a ground lift and it works fine. Now, if we can find a ground lift for getting rid of uh, background noises in Manhattan, I would be <laughs> even happier. But my my podcast partner, Ben, lives in Manhattan. And so that combination of living in Manhattan and then having a Blue Yeti um, yes. creates uh, some challenges at times. Right. I've had literally pro more than a half dozen clients, literally same setup in Manhattan with a blue Yeti. <laughs> it is, it's crazy. <laughs> so you feel my, you feel my pain then. Yeah, it's crazy. And look, you know, of course you got to make sure they're on the right polar pattern that it's, they're on the cardioid pattern. Cause if they're on Omni, forget about it. Oh my God. It'll sound like white noise, but yeah, I mean, you just got to do noise reduction and Auphonic, whatever you can. It's like, it's almost like, um, who was it? It was Josh Rivers. He, 
often tells people he, he doesn't do audio production. He does audio restoration <laughs> because most of the audio he gets is so bad. He has to just work on it like mad to get it to sound good. Yeah. And, and I have to say, actually, in all fairness, I think um, Ben does a really good job of trying to keep the gain low. And he has a really solid, you know, strong broadcasting sort of voice. So it doesn't it actually isn't too bad. It's just, you know, the occasional you know sirens that go by. And yes. You know that sort of thing. So, but yeah, it it can be it can be a challenge at times. All right. So you said your microphones. You got three Behringer eighteen hundreds, which is which is the three pack for forty nine bucks. <laughs> thirty nine bucks. Thirty nine. You can't. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, they sound actually pretty solid. I know the woman that you interviewed that had the podcast with the uh, in the garage. Yes. She. I think she said she used those. Yeah. And when I heard that, I'm like, yes, I can relate. I mean, those actually sound actually fairly decent. Yeah. On that episode, we did uh, we did like a little sound test. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I remember that. Yeah. So I'm 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 on board with those. And you had the blue Encore 100s. Now, here's my question. You have these mics. Are you where are you recording in person in your office at work? No. So usually it's in a conference room. So I um, instantly intimidate anyone who comes in for these <laughs> podcasts because I, you know, I send them an email saying, "Hey, I'd love to talk to you about this idea or this project that you just brought to life, and we're going to do this for the podcast." And people have heard it, you know. Then they walk in the conference room and there's you know XLR cables everywhere and there's mics. Uh, you know, all the way around the this huge conference table to try to isolate them as much as possible. <laughs> and they're like, they walk in, they're like, whoa, I'm intimidated. So, but yeah, I mean, it's generally, a, a, a you know, a set up in a conference room. And then, you know, I've also got my co-host on that show remote via Skype. And sometimes there's someone who's calling in via Skype as well for those sort of situations. So it's quite a thing. And then, you know, honestly, for, let's say we do a half hour of recording, it's an hour setup and a half hour teardown afterward, just because there's just so much stuff to run and, and get it right and set up. And I'm getting faster, but it's still a lot of work. Right. And then, um, so you have to go through the whole rigmarole with them. Like, okay, you got to sit close to the mic, talk into the mic and, you know, don't, you know, click your pen and tap your foot and all that. Yes, and my my boss, the CEO, is uh, a, a woman who's got Italian blood. And when I told her she couldn't tap the table, she looked at me and she's like, <laughs> "You realize you're asking the impossible." Of me, right? <laughs> oh, jeez! And she actually did a she did a very good job, I have to say, all told. I think she only did it a couple times. And the only thing that would make the your guests more nervous would be if you if it was video and you had like these big lights up, the hot lights shining right in their face. <laughs> exactly, but you know, people do they do kind of freak out about having to speak into a mic, which. I guess I can understand, but at the same time, it's so consistently true. I mean, it's just a thing. Like, I have to sit in front of a mic and I'm talking. People just get intimidated. So I try to make them as comfortable as possible, give them, like you said, just some basic guidelines, and then let them go. Yeah, well, maybe when you sound check them, you can ask them funny questions like, well, I the one I use a lot, and same with Brian Orr, is like, tell me about your first car. But maybe you could, you know come up with funnier questions to break the ice for them and that, so they can talk into the mic and almost have a little fun for like one, two minutes. I actually usually have them describe what they had for breakfast and then people going around the table and, and comparing whether they had a better or worse breakfast than everyone else. So right. but I, I agree. The lightening it up a little bit is actually a good idea. There you go. And by the way, the episode where I talked to actually Liza Miller was my guest. It was episode 25. She's the one who sometimes has up to 16 people recording simultaneously in one room for her podcast. Uh, and, and she's the one who uses those Behringer 1800s, the three pack for $39. So if you're interested in hearing that interview, that was a pretty good interview because it was a great interview. She was great. And so many people have written to me and said, you know what? I, I heard that interview and I said, I got to hear what this sounds like. And they went to her show and listened and they're like, you know what? It sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, they I always actually... expect that there's going to be all this noise. But, you know. If you set it up right and, you know, look, it takes some time. And if you tell everybody that, look, you got to talk directly in the mic, all these things add up. It's, it can sound pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's amazing what can happen. And actually, that's the thing that's really cool is that people walk in the door and they're really intimidated. But at the end of the day, I hear people coming back to me saying, that sounds really, really good. And I feel good because I know I put a lot of extra effort to making it sound really good. So it's good when people appreciate it. 
All right, let's get into editing. How crazy do you get? I try not to get super crazy. Um, I will edit out obvious gaps, like, you know, trying to find a website or whatever. But I really try to keep it as live feeling as possible because I feel like that's kind of what a podcast is really about. It's not, I don't see a podcast necessarily as needing to be this overprocessed, perfect work of art like you might imagine a corporate video being, you know, where every phrase and everything needs to be perfect. So I try to keep it as light as possible and you know, just try to edit out major gaps as well as times where we are maybe accidentally talking over one another or something like that. Nice. And how about loudness standards? Do you, well, no, you said you use Alphonic for that, right? So, so yeah. So actually the one thing I did, didn't really talk about. So when I, when I, my workflow is when I import the audio from various sources, one of the first things I do in audition is I level it all to about minus 23 luffs. And then at least that way, I have a similar set of loudness for all the inputs, regardless of how they were recorded. And then... Okay, hold on a second. So yeah. you're setting each track to minus 23. Right. So I'm, I'm doing that at the beginning, just to make sure that... Because, you know, whoever re- recorded remotely, my co-host, co-host may have recorded somewhat louder or somewhat quieter than the way I recorded it. Or maybe when I recorded it, it wasn't quite at the right level. So at least I take that first blush of it right. and just right off the bat, just level it out and then, you know, work with it from there. That is an awesome feature. And I, I wish I had that because I, um, I'm using Reaper still and, uh, which is fine. And I pretty much do all that manually using compressors and, um, and the vocal rider plugin as well. So, but yeah, that would be so much easier if I could do that. It's almost like having a phonic multi-track, like one click, just done. Yeah, and the, actually, there's actually ways of actually automating that. So you can actually create macros, essentially. So it's like, on import, do these different things to it. So it's almost like one action, which I haven't gotten to the point of actually spending the time doing it yet. But I am definitely thinking about, like, how can I automate that process even further so that I'm saving time? Right. This is cool. So now, before we started, you were talking about, uh, I guess this is the last thing we'll touch on real quick, is this idea of sort of, evolving your approach i know you said you bought a bunch of equipment and then you started doing it and it wasn't right i mean obviously for the new so so what would you suggest a a new person do just get started yeah definitely get started but look seriously at multi-track recording like the i all the advice that i had heard from other podcasts uh were looking down a two pat you know to it through a two channel output approach so mix everything get it compressed and then output into you know one channel or two channels, and then work with it from there. And then I realized that that at the end of the day wasn't I wasn't good enough at recording stuff to be able to fix the problems that could come as a result of having a hardware compressor that I didn't set exactly right, or maybe I did for one person and not another. And so you know I, I quickly one of the people who originally influenced me to move down this path was Dan. Benjamin, um, and he, you know, with the five by five network, he was the one who first even made me aware of the fact that Focusrite existed. And as I realized the challenges I was having with working with, you know, just one track that has already been squashed together, I'm like, I have to go down this path because I, I'm not good enough to be able to work with that. I need to have more control and having multi-tracks was really the way to go. So my advice to someone who's starting, look really seriously at some sort of multi-track audio interface that you can record directly into the software so that, you know, God forbid, if something doesn't happen, you have much more control over each individual element of the show rather than have to deal with something that you have very little at the end of the day control over fixing. Right, right. And I I would think a lot of people listening to this show, you know, some of them are very experienced and they probably already record in multi-track. But yeah, multi-track is the way to go. I mean, I remember... Before, when I first started, I set up my rig in New Jersey in my studio. I was using the Cliff Ravenscraft model of you do everything live through a mixer and you come out and you go into a stereo recorder and that's it. And so literally I'd have a couple people sitting around a table with me and, you know, all with their own mic. And I might have someone on Skype or someone on the phone on a computer. And literally I'd have to sound check everybody and get their level. And that's where 
having an ear really helped because you know leveling people live is not easy <laughs> and then as we started recording like if someone was on the phone i'd have to keep their fader muted until they come in because or else you're gonna or else you're gonna hear that for the whole intro of the whole show so not only was i hosting shows but i was actually mixing them live like muting things fading in faders i was doing all that live it was like this performance on a mixing board you know and but i had to do that because there's no way i was just gonna record everything into the stereo recorder at all different levels and all that because that that makes no sense so multi-track takes all that off the table and it's just like you know what record everything at a good strong level and then you fix it later work on it later exactly and then, it. that yeah and i i don't have that level of you know uh kung fu to be able to do that live i was <laughs> struggling just to get it like working so it's it's been a godsend to be able to have a, a little bit more um flexibility and, and not have to feel like i have to perform in the moment and and get that all right that see that's that makes a big difference so greg this has been awesome greg heist producer and co-host of the future stir website is thefuturestir.com and go check out that website for just to see the wordpress plugin and then of course click play or click subscribe or click cool. review i don't know what are you supposed to click greg <laughs> <laughs> any of the above would be just fantastic so yeah it'd be great yeah and chris thank you so much it was great uh, great spending time with you here and uh love always uh, chatting with you and barry yeah this has been awesome and i really want to congratulate you uh, again you know you're not a trained audio engineer you haven't been in the business for more than 25 years like some of us but you're really taking on taking it on you're using your ears and you're learning and you're upgrading equipment so i really uh congratulate you on being on this path of of improvement and evolution in in audio so Great job on that. And of course, for you listening, thanks for listening. I know you learned a lot. I look forward to talking with you next week. Until then, Greg, tell them. Sound great. Sound great! Awesome. You walk away from me where And you can't play that so But you're playing Yeah.